it's been a long time coming for us to talk about Jean Eustache. Yes, event, events in Gaza have rather events have overtaken. delayed. <laughs> Other films have somewhat been retarded on people's our progress. Minds. <laughs> yeah. Other films have been on people's minds, um, but uh, and I think the the kind of origin story of this, or the origin story for us, was seeing um, Eustache's and we'll intro Eustache in a second. But Eustache's kind of main. Um, uh, sort of, you know, most 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 notorious in a lot of ways film, The Mother and the Whore. We saw it at the BFI. Yeah, what must be going on? What three months ago now? Yeah, um, a new restoration of this fantastic uh, film, which premiered at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival. Yeah. I believe. so we got it sort of on a year time delay, and we saw it at the BFI, which we thought was the right place. And I think I'd been meaning to see it anyway, but I, I kind of but also like a 52 year time delay because yeah, it was made in 71? 73. 73. Okay. Oh, well, a 50 year. 50 year. Yeah. I think that was, it was delay. timed for the 50 years, I think. So, uh, and they watching the mother and whore kind of triggered something for, for myself and Ralph and me. We then began to dig beneath the surface a little bit. Yeah. Stash, we thought this guy's interesting. Obviously he's joining stash himself. Um, the, We'll we'll get into all of this, I think, but you know, died in uh, sort of prematurely, as they say, you know, nineteen in nineteen eighty one. He took his own life um, after a after a sort of catastrophic um, automobile accident, which happened all the time back then. Um, if anyone's seen Godard's Weekend, you'll know how the French drive. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's somewhat tragically, and it's it's off, I've read around it a little bit. And it seems a bit ambiguous. I don't know if it was necessarily the accident itself or just other shit going on his life um a, a strange parallel to jean daniel Pollet, who suffered a um uh, a train accident um in 1989 or 88 but did, didn't obviously kill himself but you know there's a strange parallelism between both Pollet of them. like kanye kind of through yeah, the, through it, it made it through, through the wire, the wire. <laughs> um but both Pollet and eustache maybe are kind of these slightly extraneous figures on the edges or the fringes of the new wave and the post new wave and i think that's kind of where their interest lies um you know, they 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 have a kind of wider orbit, like Haley's Comet, in a lot of ways. And obviously, what characterizes and actually what I'll do is I'm going to read, um, uh, not a bedtime story, but I'm going to read a, a little quote uh, by Serge Danet. Obviously, Serge Danet is like a, a, a you know a, a cahier du cinéma docent, um, and I think he had this to say about uh, Jean Eustache. Um, so he said. Um, we can we can pick this apart, but he said, in the thread of the desolate 70s, his films succeeded one another, always unforeseen, without a system, without a gap. You can debate that, I'm sure. Uh, film rivers, short films, TV programs, hyper-real fiction. Each film went to the end of its material, from real to fictional sorrow. It was impossible for him to go against it, to calculate, to take cultural success into account, impossible for this theoretician of seduction to seduce an audience. And I think what he's getting at there really is that Eustache, um, you know, didn't have his drum beaters, uh, maybe didn't have a consistent expected flow of income to make films, had to make the films that came to him. Yeah, it seems like um, one of the few French filmmakers... Who, mm. of that era who seemed to be struggling to make films uh, mm. at least anecdotally you you don't you you hear a lot about his uh his true eyes a bit but mm. you don't tend to hear much about like godard and, and Truffaut and chabrol and chabrol they all managed to just they were ramp, pumping them out rattle on because you, you know the french like film system you know was was very prodigious and and had there was a lot of money available to people to make films and a lot yeah. of patrons of the arts and i think um Eustache, uh, I think, again, this is something we can explore, doesn't really, or doesn't obviously have a, there's not like necessarily an obvious Eustachian style in a mm. way that you get, you know, you know what a Godard or a Chabrol or a Romer film is kind of going to look like, or the ways it's going to surprise you, you can kind of anticipate those things. Where you look at the deep bench of Jean Eustache's films from, you know, this 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 very discursive um rolling flowing film of mother and whore to sort of tv documentaries that are on the face of it are quite conventional like the, the yeah. rosary of pesach um you know he was quite mercurial in that sense i mean what's your 
what's your sort of prehistory with um, Eustache? And maybe, you sh- maybe do you think we should talk about the mother and the whore first? Yes, I think we'll, we'll go into radiate. depth. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just make a few general comments and mm. then we'll dive in on the mother and the whore. Um, I was somewhat apprehensive about speaking about Eustache because it's very hard to make a coherent ov- statement about his work Mm. as you say he worked between different forms i think he was someone who maybe just didn't quite settle into a form or was just ever curious about uh different devices and strategies Mm. and so then you wonder what the sort of theme undergirding it was i mean there is i know what it is maybe i'm gonna gonna give it a shot so so between like the rosary of pesach which is like this deep documentary from his hometown that he does twice uh, sort of decade apart or something yes i think like 69 68 68 interestingly and then 79 and 79 um which is about a bizarre and hilariously patriarchal uh, sort of village fates activity where um, <laughs> so true. a bunch of french men sort of <laughs> choose a young woman to be the the virgin of the town mm. the most the most kind of honorable the most, most honorable, noble the most beautiful it's not necessarily implied the most beautiful but as the mayor in the film says he's like oh well it's nice that uh, she also happens to be a very uh, beautiful uh, um, yeah it's the yeah. sort of thing that like feels incredibly normal for france at least in that era <laughs> yeah. but you would show it to someone now and they would just they, they wouldn't know yeah i assume this festival some people, probably some exists people. in a different format or it's france it might still be going on it's yeah, probably sponsored by by renault or something now yeah but uh so there's that there's also i guess what that shares in common with um a dirty story and uh, sale histoire mm. um which is this film with michael lunsdale which is sh- told twice it's a yeah. man telling a story about how much fun he had um, spying on the women's toilets through a crack in the wall. Yep. It became a pervert. The becoming of a pervert. The becoming of a pervert. And yeah. he sort of enjoys the telling of the story mm. and the people listening, some of whom are women, enjoy hearing it. Yep. And the story is told uh, with more or less identical scripts with completely different casts um, twice. But it's second time by the man allegedly who it actually happened to. So it's implied that Michael Lonsdale was one of the unseen listeners in this room. Oh, really? That's okay, it. How that I didn't it quite clock that. I it's not. It's not obvious in the kind of surface of the film, but I believe it's. You first see Michael Lonsdale, who's recounting the recounting of this story as if it happened to himself. And the second time, you're seeing allegedly the man who was the pervert. Mm. Um, so the first time round, we're. Uh, in know, perhaps this was lost on me. Yeah, I think I think this was just how I, the reading I, I read around it. You know how these things sometimes these things can be wildly wrong just because one person says it, it kind of um, becomes fact. Uh, so that could be wrong, but we can talk about that more in a bit. Anyway. But anyway, there's a sort of formal device of a doubling. Yeah, yeah. a like like weird, creepy like French like like not weird. I don't want to put a value judgment on it, but like there's mm. this. This well, is so very it's sort sex of sex. It's yeah, basically this, the this how we desire and how we look. There's this reflection on desire, uh, on the masculine desire, th- the desire through the unashamed male gaze, um, which in Mother and the Whore happens through a kind of um, a long-winded and very beautiful Romero-esque uh, love triangle story mm. that it, that also kind of is infused with the. Um, the ver- the sort of exhaustion of the sexual revolution yeah yeah that's very um, important pin in that exactly so that's um, what we'll say when we say <laughs> stuff about mother and the whore uh then he goes on to make this film my little loves which is his last film which i think was the film he always wanted to make but kind of mother and the whore it's, allowed in a lot to. of ways it's his most sort of cinematically within the french tradition anyway conventional film it's yeah. not a conventional film but and it, it's a my childhood film yeah it's 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 yeah it's a buildings roman and it is shot in in color which is yeah. unusual for him and it's shot in quite gracious painterly kind of impressionistic tones um it's it 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 feels more akin to a perhaps uh, a chabrol or a certain Truffaut or Rivet or maybe even Romain in certain instances it's it's sort of I, a film PLR sort of was the main reference PLR point yeah actually PLR definitely but uh, it has it its own it. it has its own weirdnesses and I think again I keep saying this we can talk about it but it has its own interesting um, formal 
uh, sort of explorations and unpickings of what it means to look and to desire and sure. to become an amorous subject. I mm-hmm. think that's part of that part and parcel in that in this kind of like betise the eye, you know, mm. the act of looking is, 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 you know, the main site of sexual arousal and desire. But then he also does, he's also <coughs> fixated with this storytelling. He does this film Numero Zero, which mm. was based on a, which was like a, the long version of a TV documentary called Odette Robert, which mm. is just the name of his nan. He just interviews his his grandmother for an hour for uh, two hours sure, okay. but it's an hour in the tv version um which is uh, quite tender and and um it's like can be a bit boring but yeah. sort of sweet re- like old woman telling fascinating stories yeah um which is sensitively done but like you sort of it's like you wonder like what's what's this guy getting at you know mm. and there's and also so the, between uh, that and the the dirty story you've also missed the two his 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 actual kind of like films that coincided with the new wave um robinson's room mr robinson's room and santa claus with the blue eyes there's a very good reason why i admit it those uh, have you said have you was that an intentional uh elision I just haven't seen them. So you haven't seen them. I, okay. I didn't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, we can throw talk to you. <laughs> we can talk. So these these two early films uh, were both short, you know, featurettes as it were. They were both about forty seven minutes long, forty eight minutes long. Um, they play in the terrain of the the familiar terrain of what we think a, a new wave film is in terms of content, mm-hmm. which is young or youngish people knocking around Paris, trying to fuck, mm-hmm. trying to get a few coins together going to the arcade to play on the flippers, um, mm-hmm. ordering coffee, or smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, arguing a little bit existentially or just about the next paycheck. Um, you know, these are the sort of like the uh, image we have of this kind of um, anomic uh, flaneur youth kind mm-hmm. of rolling around Paris. And so these, these are his first, you know, sort of first couple of films. Um, and, and they are interesting in their own ways because they they distend and disrupt certain ideas we have about what this youth is. And I think one of his big, the big red thread with um, Eustache, the two things maybe, I mean, beyond desire, desire is obvious with his films, mm-hmm. but I think youth is one of them. Yeah. I think he was completely, completely obsessed with youth and what the idea of youth um, in the context of the sexual revolution and, and May 68 uh, and the reverberations beyond that. Um, but also in sense of mourning, I think all of his films are completely saturated with the sense of ghosts and mourning. And I think one of the things I'll say is what, what, what we associate with the new wave, if we think about Boutou Soufflé, Bande if we think about Godot, if we think about Truffaut, what these directors were doing was adapting, was taking the tools of Hollywood um, and inserting them into the lives of their milieu. Um, yeah. You know, and they were, it was satirical, satanically done that you could have a crime caper that was about just some guys in Paris. Right? Mm. Or yeah, yeah. you could have a... Uh, Band de Pau. Yeah, Band de Pau, whatever. You see, or Breathless, which is kind of like a, a tragedy with no cause, right? Mm. Like it's a complete tragic conclusion for Belmondo that never needed to happen. You know, they're kind yeah. of these sat- satirical takes, as it were, on the Hollywood the things that make Hollywood films interesting, you know, these melodramas and crime capers and so on. Yeah. But I think with uh, Eustache, Eustache, the thing is, yeah, Godard's characters and Trevor's characters, I think it's they're desirable, sexy subjects. They're kind of, they've got a lot of riz. Um, they're very compelling. Uh, they have star status. And, you know, a lot of these actors would become stars. The difference mm. with Eustache is his characters are just losers. You know, well, they, got Jean Pelleau, he's a star. He's a star, but differently, I think. And he's, you know, they, they, they don't have charisma and they don't have charisma. Oh, they don't does. have cool. So they Jean Pelleau is so cool. Yeah, but maybe Mother and Hall, but not in his early films. Like uh, in no, the Santa one. There's right. a real sense of like, it's real. Like I uh, can't imagine Jean Pelleau not having I mean, some charm to him. I mean, now uh, obviously he's just Leod, a big, yeah, he's a yeah. big kind of burger but he's <laughs> a big flabby monster <laughs> like no no i'm not, youth, I'm not it's, saying it's, he's it's, not like design he's still a film uh, f- you know really power, energetic magnetic film actor but the kind of characters in their lives in these films you know they really yeah. are the kind of dregs of society they really are they're not rubbing a few dollars together they're rubbing a few cents together mm. um where they are wandering and obscure they're really wandering and obscure you know um and i think there's a sense which in in these first two films in these very early films um uh, Leod is 
completely sexually unsuccessful. He hangs around at this cafe. He wants to hang out at a nicer cafe. So the, the concept with the Father Christmas film is he's trying to save up enough money to buy a duffel coat because his duffel coats mm. have come in style in this year. Christ. Um, really disgustingly ugly coat when he's wearing an already really <laughs> beautiful like pattern dress bear. coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, so he ends up taking a job and it's for him, it's, he's not intellectualizing his refusal to get a job or his resistance to get a job. He just doesn't want to. Mm. Um, and he decides to get a job and uh, as a Father Christmas in sort of early December, I suppose, kind of taking photos with kids and women in the street, whatever, um, just to make enough money to get this coat that he wants. And it's extraordinary because his desire for the coat isn't believable. There's no romanticizing of the coat, this jacket. Um, there's no sense of, it's just very, yeah, just ta- it's tatters and it falls apart in their lives. So there's, there's nothing romantic about their, mm. their anomie. There's nothing poser-ish about it. They're just like layabouts and they hang around this horrible cafe. Um, and the object of their desire, which him is a coat, is to go to this nice cafe, which is nicer than the cafe he normally goes to. Is it uh, almost like a comment on sort of vacuous consumerism? It might or? be. Yeah, it did occur to me. It probably is that, you know, um, and also to to maybe get a girl, yeah. um, right? But he's... This translates into mother and the whore. A man goes to a cafe repeatedly mm. to try and find a particular find kind a of girl that sort of yeah. piques his interest in a particular kind of way that mm. he never quite manages to articulate. Yeah, and then when he does kind of get her, he kind of fumbles the bag, which is a big thing mm. about this. You know, he kind of might get talking to a woman and he's like, I don't know, didn't know what to say. So the other character will just be silent with these women who are interested in him temporarily for a moment. But this all feels um, borrowed from like a lot of the early Godard films with yeah. Jean-Pierre. Like I feel like Jean-Pierre transfer or in the truth of Antoine L later films like there's this like he just has this like comical he keeps saying Jean Pierre Jean Pierre Jean Pierre you mean Laird are we talking about Eustache or I'm talking about Jean Pierre the actor Was isn't it Laird or Laird Laird okay I was thinking I was thinking it's Lair. like a, more of a hard D like maybe Lair. maybe oh whatever I don't care I don't know <laughs> Um, first of all no I mean uh, it's okay I don't know <laughs> I, I remember going on Google actually and trying to find out how you say it. Le. it's kind of it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those really slurry French names isn't it like Le. hold on we're gonna have to settle this aren't we yeah um, yeah so I think the way that anyway whatever I, I, I think that he's kind of like a traveling like you know a bit like even how he is in that Skolomovsky film you know a bit of a sad sack well no, but he's sort of charming and lo- and like lovable and uh, yeah. Well, yeah. He's actually, if anything, he's got this kind of Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin-esque kind exactly. of like he's, the he's, he's, he's like, like Keaton, the bigger, I think. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. a sort of hilarious, sort of slightly blank well, face, Harold Lloyd kind of thing. Yeah, well, hapless, a bit nerdy, hapless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of it's like that plus a bit of a Romeric kind of noodling uh, dialogue about you know how you, you know. Uh, um, Oh, hold on. Um, a noodling dialogue about uh, mm. people's feelings and whether you'll ever fall in love truly and all of this. But they don't business. really intellectualize in the same way that Roma. We look at how to pronounce better some of the mm. most mispronounced words <laughs> in the world, like this other curious word. But how <laughs> do you say what you're looking for today? So true. We are looking at how to pronounce the name of this French actor. In French, they said as Jean Pierre Lou. Oh. Jean-Pierre Léo. Léo. Jean-Pierre Léo in English. Jean-Pierre Léo. Jean-Pierre Léo. Here are more videos on how to pronounce more confusing words and names too many. Mis- <laughs> okay, Léo. Okay. We are looking at how to pronounce the name of this French luxury fashion and perfume <laughs> brand <laughs> that was founded sure in 1952 in France by designer Hubert de Givenchy. Givenchy produces accessories, haute couture clothing, perfumes. Uh, how okay. do you think you pronounce the fashion brand that spell L O E W E? Like Lueve. I bet it's got. I bet it's a we bit We are looking right? at how to pronounce the name of Spanish luxury fashion house Spanish. specializing in leather goods, clothing, perfumes, out. and other fashion accessories, and founded in 1846. How do you go about pronouncing this name? It's not cl- Loro, but rather Lueve. Ah, oh, yes. Lueve. Pretty Lueve. 
thing. Um, I'm so glad I feel more informed now. The only thing um, you can't pronounce is English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny because it's like... Um, Tommy Hilfiger. Givonche. Givonche. Oh, they're so long. And then company manufacturing apparel, footwear, <laughs> accessories, fragrances, Welcome and to, home uh, furnishings. How cost about the name of this brand? Tommy Hilfiger. <laughs> That's not right. Tommy Hilfiger. That's not even correct. How are you supposed to say it? Tommy Hilfiger. Uh, <laughs> Tommy Hilfiger. Um, yeah, but okay. So basically, Jean-Pierre Lure plays. Um, yeah, he's he's kind of like this 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 almost this fetish actor for um, uh, Eustache. Oh, new wave crew, yeah, yeah. So which is yeah, he he got past it. You know, he's passed it's around. A bit, it's just fusion thing. cooking. It's a bit of <laughs> it's a bit of breast on. Mm. It's got this almost like it's got these beautiful fades. The things fade up from black, and actually, it's not interesting detail. It's mm. actually in camera fades with the aperture because you can see the sort of like depth stopping down. Oh, interesting. Very, very, in the bouquet sort of narrow. It's very Griff- Griffithian in a way, using <laughs> yeah. the, the also, collar to, um, to, to, to create an aperture on a, on a shot. Diegetic music only, which mm. really adds a fucking edge to the film. I mean, it's four hours, I think. Yeah, Mother in the Hall. Yeah, it's really, a really intense viewing experience. Yeah, it's quite, because the thing is, one, there's one thing that people say about, um, which I, I read at one point, and it clicked with uh, um, Eustache, which was people talking about his, his kind of cinematic style, in terms of blocking and composition, yeah. his camera work to be unobtrusive. That's what they yeah. used. I think that's true. There's a lot of careful pans here. Yeah, there. there's kind of an observational editing as well. Very mm. in, like he really does dialogue scenes with this amazing judicious editing where mm. you're just watching like one person listen for ages and like mm. the way he decides to cut back. It's just always yeah, it, it, um, what, it's subtle, but you know you're watching a master at work. It's strange that he never really made anything else like that. Yeah, like he just get out, came out the blue. Like he did all the experiments, which he obviously learned a lot from, and some of them yeah. are more interesting in, than others. Like there's this film, Alex's Photo, which is kind of a bit like Forrest Frampton's nostalgia. It's just like a woman looking through photos and talking yeah. about it. And like a narrative is revealed somewhat through that. But She's like, just describing the content of the photos. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's Poletti and it's essayistic filmmaking. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's in that tradition, although I don't know if like people talk about his shorts that much. Even no, I think so. like this season at the BFI was maybe the first time we're kind of getting familiar with that work but yeah there's what's interesting is that unlike people who make work they look like that he hasn't spent his whole life making loads of films like Roma or mm. like uh, Godard like he hasn't been knocking them out like he just made this one really long one that has like enormous power to it and mm. see and must have been very influenced by the work that's been made around the time and maybe I think so and it was like a know. little bit you know it, it, there was, it was stochastic in a way because you it was 73 it's after many of the leading lights of the new way had kind of abandoned this style of filmmaking and went moved mm-hmm. on to other things right you know by this point we're stepping into the political with the Sieger Vertov group um, we're stepping into the fantastical with Jacques Rivet you know sort of uh, Julian Slingo boating we're getting historical epics we're getting the mm-hmm. era of Melville you know we're getting sort of s- spy thrillers and historical thrillers um, crime you know crime is taken to a different place mm. um, he's like the last person doing this from the new wave mm. um, he's a bit younger he was part of Cahir in the 50s um, obviously was making films in the 60s but there's a weird sense in which this is why I was talking about mourning in a way because he's talking about this post 68 post sexual revolution generation and the one feeling that kind of emanates through these films is kind of exhaustion um, everyone's mm. very tired and kind of their backs are up and they're cynical about approaches and other people and they're a thorny, you know, sort of like, um, oh, what's her bloody name? Uh, so that his new his new love interest in this film, uh, which is what's her name? Fucking Veronica. This uh, Francois Lebrun's character. Francois Lebrun's character, you know, who's the girl he kind of chirps is at this cafe um, and kind of begins a tryst with. Um, she someone described her as sort of like already a bit like an old woman, where she wears this shawl around her head. She's Looks weary. She's a little older. Who describes her like that? I, I read it somewhere online. It's in it. um, but it's a great, great turn as an old woman in Vortex by yeah, Gaspar Noé. Yeah, absolutely. She's still going. Alongside Dario Argento. Dario Argento. But there's a sense in which everyone's a little bit tired and a little bit closed, you know, against the kind of openness and the free willingness of the new wave, new vague, and the, the openness of May 68 and the kind of infinite remixology of the situationist movement. 
here are people who are a little bit cloistered and they're still lost, you know, sort of five years later. And it's impossible to resist, you know, um, any narrative about post, not post-revolutionary, but post sort of, like a, the structure of feeling that comes after a, a kind of failure, like a moment of revolutionary potential is wasted, you know. The student protests of 2010, 11, or Corbyn in 2019, mm. it's quite difficult to, to escape these feelings of kind of deflation and um, and loss and kind of uh, indeterminacy, which is kind of what he does for this. It's like 1973 and these characters are trying to do the new wave, but they're just a little bit tired. Like they're mm. all tired. They argue, they bicker, they bicker endlessly um, in this film. Um, they follow each other here and there. Uh, Leo's character is still kind of at the beginning of the film holding a flame to this girl, um, oh, yeah. you know, uh, who's a student at the University of the Sorbonne. Uh, uh, he starts the film, begins the film borrowing, some, uh, borrowing a car of his uh, actual his girlfriend, <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of going to the university and trying to like kind of doorstop her, and she's a bit like, uh, yeah, you know, moments over, like trying to move on. And there's a, yeah, there's a big sense of things trying to move on. You mm. know, people are trying to get on with their lives, but there are a few fast holdouts like Lior's character, who's still trying to kind of him and his intellectual mate, um, uh, who kind of plays several roles in this film. Not several yeah, roles, sorry. He, guy. he has this kind of like glassy, very acerbic, kind of difficult mate, wingman vibe. Wingman, yeah. And they just kind of sit together and they kind of pucker their brows and they kind of spit poison at people and they're very cynical it's a very pessimistic energy that floats over this film it is not you know breathless which is so energetic and jumps yeah, and takes risks fucking hell, and flows. Hippie guy. Yeah, yeah this kind of hippie guy so with this long yeah. lank hair he looks a bit like Eustache actually where's the subtitles at so we're just we're rolling the film aren't we? <laughs> people might wonder why we've um so we're not doing a video episode this uh, this time because both Rath and I are a little bit sicky. Yeah, I've got a horrible spot on my face. Yeah, and I feel also, rough as shit. Also, listeners, do tell us what you think about the video hmm. turn. Because it's a massive pain in the ass to <laughs> <laughs> And it does make good social media content, but, you know. If it doesn't enhance your your experience with Return to Form. Yeah, I think, it, ironically, I think we do the videos more when, like, when we're like saying more controversial mm. stuff because mm. it's like funnier we're exposing ourselves yeah. to the, the bullets of the enemy um, I think we've got to do some audio in the episode as well uh, for the more sort of like serious auteurist stuff yeah um, but we're watching, a, we're watching a scene now where him and his friend are sitting at the table and yeah like in a classic Eustachian way Lure is talking but with the camera is fixed on his mate Who's but this is thing? this a classic Eustachian thing or is it just a classic this film thing? I think it's, no, yeah, you're right. It's a classic mother the, and a whore thing. Because he develops <laughs> his own vernacular in each work. Mm. And apart from the sort of, the, the, the subject matter, it's kind of hard to find a, a thread between the making and the formal aspects, mm. you know, as we return well, to I form. Think he, you know, he's a sort of, so he's an ethnographer in a lot of ways, uh, Eustache. And I think mm -hmm. there's something... So is this an ethnography of the 60s? Yeah, I think so. I think he owes more to Jean Rouge than he does to Godard, for example. I think he's closer mm -hmm. to that, that bent of verite filmmaking. Um, you know, Chronique du Net. Um, Chronique du Net. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if a, 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 a weed dealer in, um, in France has ever sold Chronique <laughs> du Net. Um, I do wonder about that. Um, but you've got this... In Italy, they sell Chronique de... De la mort, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, so he owes, he has this kind of ethnographic style, and I think you see it in certain of his films where you'll be having a, a scene that is drama, and then he'll cut to a tradition or people who feel very unprofessional. You know, so in mm. um, My Little Loves, there's a fantastic moment where this young boy is, you know, he's basically like an 11 year old boy everywhere, like, you, you know, sort of becoming mm. vaguely sexually aware. Um, and so now he's desperate to shag basically yeah. so anything that moves regardless of age um, you know he's kind of interested in this scene can I tell you my two sorry you can't. well I'll, I'll explain the scenes there's a scene where they're listening to a sort of village uh, countryside folky mm. rendition song sung by these young girls 
and he stands next to this, this girl who's about his age, maybe a little bit younger. Mm. So the scene's kind of hinging on whether he kind of reaches out her hand and begins like caressing her leg. Yeah. It's quite strange. It's quite a taboo crossing because mm. um, she does seem younger than him in a way. Yeah. So he be kind of becomes this kind of sexual... They're both very young. Yeah, both very young. This kind of sexual... I don't know, predator or whatever, but like there's something quite unbalanced and weird about this, mm. this film in particular in a way that, you know, everyone in... Uh, the the mother and whore is a you know fundamentally a broken but consenting adult mm. in, a, in a very dysfunctional um, through a menage a trois, um, but in this film his sexual energy is is quite dangerous. It's jagged. It's um, yeah. you know he's, there's a way in which he's this girl is far too young for him to be caressing <laughs> her leg, um, and there's something very strange about it. But the way he shoots this kind of folk performance, it seems very like the girls kind of blush and look at the camera directly mm. when they're singing women and men in the crowd look just like villagers like it's like mm -hmm. he just turned up to this actual village fate um and filmed it so it kind of you get this sense in which these films kind of push between the ethnographic and the documentarian and the dramatic and i think he that's that's the thing that feels characteristic between films um yeah. you know because you kind of get it even going back to these very early films so mr robinson's rooms we get uh footage shot in these kind of nightclubs um mm you know these bars where people hang out and you get a lot again a lot of actors looking directly at the camera i think you know he's just turned up to places that are just doing their thing and he happens to be shooting a film in the context of these spaces you know there's not a really close sense of controlling who is an actor and um controlling blocking beyond his his actual protagonists i think that's something that feels kind of eustachy and this, this ethnographic impulse um to document and account for real life um Yes, and maybe in that sense, his film about his childhood and his film about with the two main features, mm. Mother and the Whore and the Little Loves. Uh, one is a film essentially about intimacy, Mother and the Whore. Yeah. And another is about um, his childhood with tinges of intimacy as coming of age feelings, as you yeah. refer to. And yeah, there's like an interesting surprising uh, conflict there because yeah. you're being ethnographic but you're also dealing with the personal and and mm. that creates if that's what's going on in the mother and the whore and i don't i wouldn't th if it weren't for all the other films he made i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't accept the idea that mother and the whore was ethnographic but it does it, it does manage to stand you know it doesn't have loads of you know, uh, non-digesting music. It doesn't. It it sort of has a method that it follows. But then, you know, so does Bresson. You know, it's like so does Roma in a way. It does. It does just feel like it almost feels like a film that he didn't even mean to make that good. But it mm. just sort of like coincidentally, he just sort of followed a line, uh, followed a process, and it it worked really well. Well, this and is working what Sir Janae said well. about following a, a subject, a material to the end of that material, you know, kind of pursuing it until it kind of collapses under its own weight. Yeah. Own way. And I think there's a sense, you know, the films kind of do, they don't end dramatically. They just end, you know, I think maybe Mother and Hall kind of has like a more conventional ending. In some, it doesn't though, because you get this scene where he goes back to his, his um, paramours, flat which is this tiny little hot yeah. uh, garret in a in a hospital because she's a nurse um and oh, he thing. sort of c collapses on the floor pretty much yeah. he just ends up sitting on the floor and it's, it's not it's a puppy it's a puppy it's not really an ending he's sort of confronting i suppose the weight of his own desire and his in, uh, uh, insecurity about what his desire is and a new um, responsibility emerging yeah new responsibility because she's pregnant or oh, it oh wait wait um that's the, the film French for pregnant, isn't it? No, probably what not. What is the French for pregnant? Um, Coco Van. <laughs> 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 um, but un pain dans le creuset. Je ne comprends pas. But uh, he, yeah. So there's a sense of the film. Enceinte. 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 A saint. What's the genealogy of that? I don't know. Or oh, etymology, rather. Not the genealogy. <laughs> well, the father and the mother. Yeah, um, <laughs> so true. Um, <laughs> but there's a sense, yeah, his films kind of... Saint means girded in English. Really good. So, in girded. In girded, which probably is similar to... Pre what does... P 
What is prank noughts? No. Um, so basically, so yeah, so there's a sense in which his films kind of end not on a moment of catharsis or cathexis or or a kind of obvious narrative beat. Um, My Little Loves kind of ends indeterminately. The character's gone away. This young boy is, has this kind of semi-idyllic uh, upbringing in rural France with his grandmother and he goes to the city with his kind of like newly present mother who lives in a little flat and her uh, Portuguese, Spanish lover um, mm -hmm. uh, who's a farm labourer and they because you got such a good memory of this film I, yeah. see, I saw it like three months ago and I'm basically having to scrub I'm trying, it I'm, to trying to, I'm trying to scrub for the audience's benefit uh, and he kind of encounters people who might become his friends you know as like a young boy he spends a lot of time at this cafe which is again a very Eustachian thing um, and they there's a great scene where they're kind of uh, watching women they're people watching basically they have like whole conversations about like whether they've seen a dead body or not mm. like there's, it's really a lesson in like in um, how like dialogue doesn't have to like all the lessons you get told about mm. screenwriting about like making and I fight against this myself because I often like when I write stuff I, I always want every line to like be important or like inform or something mm. but it's really nice actually almost podcasty and um, <laughs> to, to kind of it's let nothing <laughs> to let your characters uh, just chat chatter and you know the themes will be important but you really just let i mean roma does this as well like mm. i remember there's a scene in like love in the afternoon where one of roma's characters is like do you think if you could just die by switching a light switch you would just do it mm. you know like these kinds of like existential well, roma, questions just kind of waiting emerge. for the characters to say something important through the unimportant babble we're waiting for them to hit no, on but some of the roma I films i think the ones of like the uh, moral tales, is yeah, it? Moral tales, yeah. Th those ones are quite philosophically happy. They are. I mean, Claire's knee in particular is like his most philosophically God, engaged I hate film. That film. Yeah, for Claire's knee is a lot That's I like about Claire's knee, but it's, there's so much about it, which is too it because it's such an early film for Romer. It um, he learns to strip away the overt philosoph uh, philosophical mm. digressions because they dominate the film. You know, we have a man who's a Pascalian who meets a man who is not and he has to confront the limitations of his beliefs in, in God and, and faith. I thought that I didn't like... It's also surfaced. I thought that I didn't like Claire's Knee because when I watched it, I was like a bit woke or something because it, I thought I was just upset about this like randy middle-aged guy perving on a girl <laughs> with like, legs. Mm. But then... Obviously, I, I, I really like all this creepy Eustache stuff. Mm. And when I look back on Claire's knee, I've watched little clips of it. Mm. And it is just pretentious. He's just, he's just banging on about the philosophy, the philosophy of like really fancying this girl. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, if you're going to be Randy, just get Randy. Like, well, later you know, he will it's learn. It's more creepy to sort of intellectualize yeah. it. Later, Romo would learn to allow characters to talk indirectly about their feelings yeah it's exactly. like here they're talking very directly um and i think but when roma characters do talk directly it's amazing like that amazing line in winter's tale where mm. she's like oh i i love you only enough to destroy your life you know mm. not enough to actually like yeah you know. i mean I, I don't know with, with you stash it's different because our characters are there's a lot of detritus conversational detritus or repetitions they talk about the same thing which might be girls or money um, they negotiate the, the 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 frontiers of their feelings for each other in a very unsure way. They make commitments and then break mm. them. You know, there's a great scene where um, Lure, they have a dinner party. Him and his girlfriend and his lover who are trying yeah. to have this uneasy three way. I'm trying to make it work. I'm trying to make it are work. You guys open. <laughs> you guys open. Uh, then there is a moment where he storms off. Yeah, because he feels like he's been slighted and he's you know has a hissy fit. So he easily offended. It's kind of beautiful. <laughs> so thin skinned. It's amazing. <coughs> and he leaves, but then comes back again. And then they have. Then they can finally talk in a way. And we get mm. this amazing. You know, Veronique's character has this amazing uh, monologue. You know, sort of five or ten minute um, monologue that kind of explores finally her kind of feelings. Is this before or after like the insane like Benny Hill? threesome failure where he like it's, turns, off, it's after that he like turns yeah. to one of them and like starts trying to make out with them and then like so it doesn't really like, she kind of rebuffs she him rebuffs and he, him goes and he turns other. around and gets the other and he's just like oh god guy can't catch a break 
Um, very funny. So, I mean, very like it's very it's kind of light on its feet whilst mm. really. I mean, I guess I think earlier I described it as being quite intense, but mm. that does it a disservice because it has it was really light on its feet in its exploration and it, it it's this kind of like this indirectness this uh, where you mm. by you get closer to this intensity mm. by chittering and chattering around it and it's sort know, of failing for a long time yeah there's a lot of pulses of failure like we it's 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 very high energy and low energy at the same time mm. um characters are putting a lot of energy into not doing anything yeah that's what we put it um and i think it, you could kind of convey carry that logic back to sort of the dirty story as well you know these mm. two two recounted stories i mean they're very precisely told what's interesting about them is the ways these two stories kind of differ and they slip and they don't slip in really interesting ways but they slip a little bit in terms of the telling like a de certain detail be pulled out differently and there's so there's something joyously raucous it's what made me think of Bataille um, and erotics of Bataille maybe um, you know when we talk about erotics in France we think about Barthes and Lover's Discourse or we think about Bataille Bataille's I unpack all this a bit I feel like Lover's Discourse is more about longing it's more about longing and the and subjects and objects of longing fantasy. but like yeah Bataille is very much the this this kind of you know the arch fantasist of mm. where being really basically insanely horny can take you creatively yeah. in a lot of ways you know, if you want to strip it down to its parts and I think which is something he liked to do which is something he liked to do um, and there's something in the dirty story where you, you know, there's a real relishment in recounting these stories. You know, everyone in the room begins to participate. Um, you know, the women offer, you know, because most of his audience are women, and or Michael Lonsdale's audience and the other man's audience are women, and they. Some blokes as well. A couple of blokes, but the women kind of contribute more. You know, there's yeah, well, a Q and A session more at the end of each. For the for not for the fact that they're not recoiling in horror. Recoiling in horror, yeah. They mm. they sort of become fascinating for that, and then they kind of I think it's referred to like, oh, you know, usually people are disgusted with. He me says, when I say this, this. says women hate it when I bring up this story, but actually, here's a room for women who the women are like, attentive. oh no, it's really fascinating. It's great. I love to hear about how you look at these. Yeah, women one at on. one point, it's like I think I'll do the same, and she's yeah. like, is this cafe still open? He's like, no, no, it's closed down. You can't. The great stuff about vagina where he's like you know sometimes an absolute bombshell will have the most ugly disgusting vagina and sometimes <laughs> yeah. the most beautiful vagina will be belong you know, to the most plain woman or something yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's so true <laughs> <laughs> I will not comment in the space of this uh, we're going to go on record um, but yeah there's a sense in which I mean it's so hard to talk about your stash because you know the, the thing he's doing now which is really precise dialogue yeah really really precise measured you know, acting dialogue is not something he does elsewhere. Mm. There's a certain number of things he does elsewhere which he doesn't repeat. So you talked about these kind of fades, and the fade comes to its apogee in uh, My Little Loves, where it's almost like a blinking eye. It's very slow mm. and very lazy, and the scene will kind of blink in and out, not to cut to a new scene in space or time, but will blink on a scene. Mm. And we'll just see that scene advanced a few seconds, maybe. Uh, here there's a point where the young man is watching a tryst between two lovers. Yeah. Sort of, you know, 18, 19, 20, whatever, in a sort of dark, semi, semi shaded alleyway. He's just watching them have this encounter and then walk away. And we do get these cuts and then we get this blinking aperture. And then we're still seeing these people and then they walk mm. away. And there's something very lazy and observant about it, uh, which is, again, this kind of ethnographic impulse to look and to interrogate looking, which I think is something that Eustache is really interested in. You know, what does it mean to look? And actually, if you think about it in a, in a purely symbolic way, the looking of dirty story through a hole, looking up into a vagina, which is what he's doing. Yeah. You know, there's there's holes. There's these kind of portals in his films. You know, it's, it's very... <laughs> is this a reach? Is it a reach? I no, but I think there's a real concern with like, just apertures and looking and sure, observation sure, sure. and often the kind of um what it says about us to be looking i think that's kind of his his his, his concern um i mean i i find the story like i mean i guess what's interesting is like with the dirty story is like the lack of a moral center quandary mm. or the, the, the something something morally morally questionable I think objectively, no, there's no objective. Maybe there is, who knows? Uh, not, not a question that we concern ourselves with anyway. Um, but like, you know, generally speaking, mm. like staring at people while they're on the toilet without them knowing or consenting is mm. 
not on. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, and, and that, quit, but like, presumably not very pleasant either. But you know, but for, for the viewer, <laughs> for the viewer. I don't know. Well, like, you know, that's a question. That's what you're into. Question sorry. the person who don't mean to judge. decided to do that. But um, yeah, it's like that. The film doesn't. Um, it's not, you know, the film doesn't sort of dwell on on the ethics of that. You know, where where even no. but the ethics of that are like therefore like m- prompt pronounced in the viewer's brain as a result of not have mm. not being not being, con- not being not exactly exactly. Yeah, but it's it, it's funny in that sense because the yeah, we're waiting. When the same way as the Virgin, the story of the you know, you're mm. never like, you're never told whether it's right or wrong. No one questions whether it's right or wrong to do this bizarre, like, very like um, patriarchal ceremony around a young woman. Yeah, he's withholding uh, judgment. And so you have to. Maybe this is the same with the pig slaughter film, or I haven't oh, seen yeah, so that. Oh yeah, so there's a film in which uh, which it again looks at a different kind of right in in in, in rural France, which yeah. centres on the. 50 minute films is in, in a very graphic detail apparently about the slaughtering of a pig for a feast um, and I think yeah so again he's looking an unbroken stare yeah. but I can't tell whether he's doing it because like I can't tell whether it's good because he's like choosing not to make it a moral question I think or so I think he's, it might be that simple whether, I think he's like, withholding judgment but whether that's a choice or whether he's mm. just French and he just thinks it's mm. fine no because he goes further than a lot of his 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 colleagues right like even in um, these very early films so like uh, Santa Claus with the Blue Eyes and uh, Mr. Robinson's Room they talk about desire longing sex and their need for these things in a way that I haven't heard in other films from the same era or later which is that yeah. they really say do you want to fuck that woman yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to fuck that woman. I think I could fuck her. Do you think she's good in bed? They're really upfront about things that are kind of implied. You know, even for Goddard, who's a very sexy filmmaker in a lot of ways, kind of like he's a bit too bourgeois in some ways to yeah. to really say fuck. You know, um, but Mondo's not going. You know, she's not saying New York Herald Tribune. Sorry, can I fuck you? Whereas in um, Eustache, characters are just saying that. You know, yeah. they they there's a great scene in Mr. Robinson's room where they, these two men kind of run into this woman and they chirps a bit and she wants to go to a dance so they agree to accompany her. And they're both kind of flirting with her and trying to yeah. get with this woman. Um, they go to this club but they're both so paralyzed by what to really say to this woman that they can't really dance with her. She's dancing with all these, all these other men at this club and they're getting more and more infuri- infuriated about their, their impotence. Um, and then she sits down for a bit and one of them's there and he has this quite... He's very forward and like mm. really pushes it with her. She goes off and then his friend comes back and he's more titillated by recounting how forward he was and how mm. inappropriate he was with her. And his friend's like, oh my God, you didn't say that, did you? And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. And he's, he's actually, the interesting thing is, he's exaggerating a bit because mm. we've just seen this conversation happen. He kind of actually tells his friend what he kind of really wanted to say it's right. quite it was quite forward what he did say but what he's actually saying to his friend is even more forward so he's kind of playing up how okay. indifferent he is about you know how forward and brusque he was and how sexually kind of open he was to this woman we're getting to the core of it now and there actually. is something there right about the recounting and i think it is the, it recounting. is a sort of um what's the word for like storytelling well in a sort of lit linguistic literary way like the fabula the, the pure yeah, raw story true. of something the structure of the story yeah and I think he's interested the in the raconteurs you know yeah but it's, it's writ <laughs> anyway it's like <laughs> it's not writ at all actually it's but it's about how people yeah there is a storytelling thing there because I mean a lot of Mother and a Whore is people talking exactly what yeah. I mean is that like, it's, the, titil- it's the titillation things. and you have it one would hope that in the more sort of singular conceptual pieces um, so like Alex's photos right where they're like yeah. talking about photos rather than like seeing we're not looking at the photos we're yeah. looking at people talking about well, photos we are yeah. looking at the photos but we're not yeah. looking at like what the photos show like the vo- like but they pho- become interesting through the through narrative the exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and the same with like Mother and the Whore is about like how it's more exciting to talk to people about whether you're going to fall in love with them than it is to like to actually, actually fall, fall in, in love, love with them. them. Mr. Mr. Robinson's place is a film about it's actually easier or more exciting and more, more kind of erotic in a way to talk about wanting to fuck people than yeah, actually yeah. fucking them because neither of these guys fuck anyone in this film. Yeah. Um, in Santa Claus with the Blue Eyes, again, it's the fantasy of longing for somebody um, than reality because Leah does not fuck anyone in this film. He has a, has a fumbly 
make out session with a woman who then kind of gets really repelled mm. by him and runs away um, um my little loves how do we apply it to this film i was i was coming around uh, to that. i think I was a lot of it's about because it it's his dawning budding sexuality i think a lot of it you know he there's he doesn't have any sexual experiences in the film but he does kiss a girl of his own age at, towards the end of the film in his, this in his grasses so for the way it like tracks towards them i'm just gonna in bring the country it up. they're in the countryside yeah, yeah. basically and they're chatting to some 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 girls <coughs> excuse me it's not a problem they go on this yeah oh this this like they're great this, teenage like, makeouts crash they? teenage kiss mm. um they're about the same age no you were saying there was a disparity it was just with a different that, i just thought it was earlier in the film this is when it's a bit more even and that's mm. his his yeah he kisses the way it girl. turns around here i think it's so beautiful can I also say mm. another great scene from My Little Loves where he's, which has actually got a voiceover where he's recounting it, um, where he's like in a church and he's like right behind a girl at church in church. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah he's yeah. got, a, he's got a hard on. Amazing. And scene. he like, he like moves really close to her cause he's got the hard on. Yeah. And then she like turns around and doesn't like, isn't outraged, but it's just like, looks a bit confused, you know? Um, yeah. And I think like that's, yeah, and here as well, he's describing, okay, so the subtitles are on, let's pump it up a bit. Yeah, so he kisses. I mean, it's an amazing, beautiful shot. of. It's one of the best, like, shots of some people kissing mm -hmm. in the sense that, like, you really, f you, again, your your mind sort of imagines the kiss because you, mm -hmm. c you they kind of just, like, attach onto each other, <laughs> like, sort of, like, mollusks or something. They've, they've not really um, done this before. It's exactly. The they're they kind of they've they've got received over determined idea of maybe what a kiss is. Exactly. And they're kind of just holding their mouths together almost in this, you know. And then the camera or, or, but it's like almost like they're in a freeze frame. The leaves are moving more than they are in the mm. background. The the camera turns around. Maybe this would be good for they're a not social really media clip. Moving at all, clip. are they? They're, 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 no, their, yeah. their bodies are very still, the mouths aren't moving, the heads aren't moving. Yeah, like you said, it's almost a freeze frame. And then I close my eyes to shut out the others. I wish I could close my ears. You can hear the leaves kind oh, of God, it's in the background. So yeah, it's about now the this camera leaves them and pans away oh, and leaves them in great. this moment of I suspended longing. I didn't love longing. this film, but when yeah. this shot happened, I was like so excited with the church erection, mm. and then <laughs> it kind of just dissipated for me. I was like, I don't care about the it French childhood and whatever. And then, uh, and then but they lay down in the grass in a shortly, so they then have a couple of hours yeah. where they talk, and he uh, surfaces the idea of having sex with her because it's something he knows about, but he's oh, far yeah. too young to have sex and she's far too young to have sex. Um, she tells him no. Um, you know, that's correct in the situation, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, she tells him Here's no. the moral judgment happens the moral the podcast, on the podcast, not in the film. But, you know, there's, there's something wonderfully ambiguous about him confronting the idea of sex. And then he touches her leg. It feels like such a huge transgression. I mean, this is mm. so much stronger than Claire's knee. Mm. And she sort of takes agency, withdraws. I mean, this kind of very restrained Bressonian mm. uh, acting is perfect for um, for, this, for this like nascent romance that, yeah. that doesn't know it doesn't know how to express. It's itself. like I think it doesn't know how to express itself, but they're also contending with the idea they have of of romance and on-screen yeah. sex and kissing and and uh, fucking, as it were, because these are all things that you absorb through film. And, mm -hmm. and so on and they're contending with that and they're also contending with the real realness of their own natural feelings as it were mm -hmm. as they are unmediated by film um, yeah. and literature and I think that's one of, yeah so I think in all of his films he's he's grappling with the tell don't show tell don't show in a that's way that's the Ustash motto yeah somehow he gets away with it yeah and, you know, the, yeah like we said this you know this you know this this idea that the story of sex or love or desire is more compelling and powerful than the reality which mm. is messy and difficult and crashes against the rocks of of incomprehension uh, between people you know um because the great thing about modern horror it's very rare for people to really communicate their feelings in that film we, people talk a lot but they don't talk necessarily about the right things in that moment yeah, they usually talk about stuff that happened some other time mm. that anguished them in order to say, I am anguished now, you know. Um, yeah, it's a wonderfully indirect <coughs> telling. It's like telling all the time, but not telling the thing that's there. It is, yeah, it is a remarkable... It's remarkable and quite rare to find... I mean, you get people like Herzog, I guess, who work between medium media, but um, uh, to find 
a practice that's so imaginative and like it wasn't like I mean maybe he just but he did he, his short films are sort of, or his documentary the, he just drifts between these different forms but he's like mm. yeah he doesn't mind he doesn't mind doesn't seem to mind like applying quite a different format for each each one but, but I kind of like that because it makes him uh, a bricoleur you know in a lot of ways like he's assembling and, and mm. kind of hashing these things together as he goes the, the form matches the needs that he had but like yeah. we said there are threads that connect these films yeah. you know, about the we telling of there. desire about ethnography about um, mourning this kind of post 68 mourning which I think is very present in his films um, because like you said he's the last guy holding the burning torch of the new wave um, and he's mm. seeing what's left there. We kind of seen the ghosts of the new wave dance around a little bit. Um, yeah, he sort of turned up at the new wave, like when everyone else went home, because everyone else was yeah. like making films in their own style by that point. Like you had the new wave, where he just does the sort of like he does like his own version of four inch blows with little <laughs> arms, and then yeah, he does like his own version of like masculine, feminine, or like all, mm. all those early Godard films about men and women, you know. Um. Uh. Yeah. He sort of he k- kind of turns up to the party late and like and yeah. yeah he hangs around. He finds something a little bit like all the um, all the pop balloons and spilled yeah, drink. Yeah, exactly. Party. He's kind of there, and the lights are coming on, and he's he looking at the room so, with, with a sober yeah. eye. Yeah, and I think that's what makes Eustache interesting mm. in a way. And I think mm. um it it would be probably boring if he made ten films like Mother in the Hall. The fact that it's a singular and quite strange. Um, like entity that exists independent of anything else really it really exists independently it's not really like anything else in the same mm. way that My Little Loves yeah it's a little bit like PLR it's a little bit like certain Chabrol films or Ramon sometimes you know it's a little bit there's certain ways in which towards the end it's a little bit like you know, it's collection or something in terms of that shot yeah. it's very golden basking loving um, well, style I, but can I t- explain to you why that's the case oh, please same DOP, Nestor Armandos. Easy. Okay, that would make a lot of sense. On both those films. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, imagine, yeah, it does have that kind of rural idyll, this pastoral glimmer and sheen that um, uh, Collection News has, um, which is maybe my favorite Romare film. But, like we always say, Romare, the, the Romare film you like the most is the one you saw, saw last. And yes, Collection News was the last Romare film. Oh, so. really? Interesting. Um, but. Shout out. Great film. How, how are we doing for time? Ingrid Cavan is also a great turn as the mother. Um, we're coming up to an hour. She's hideous, the mother, when we first see her. Yeah, you know, when yes. she first arrives in the house in this, in this film. Fassbender's wife, no? Yeah. But she's but really made up in her hair. Amazing. Yeah, it's uh, Fassbender's beard. Um, uh, Claire's knee, Fassbender's beard. <laughs> so when, um, when uh, she turns up in this house and she's been this kind of absent mother, yeah. she's really dolled up. And there's something quite shocking about the intrusion yeah. of this very made up um, quite uncomfortable looking woman appearing in this house um, with the son who obviously doesn't really recognize her and is obviously much rather just hang out with Nan yeah. who doesn't really make any demands of him um, yeah I think I think there's something very very strange about uh, particularly about that film I think it's the one that mm. feels very uneasy about watching it um, because we're encountering something very a, a very real confrontation with desire and, and youthful longing um, but across all like Eustache films all Eustache films have something about them that's just a bit weird yeah, I, I, I feel like also sh- I mentioned earlier, but like Maurice Piella, mm. who we reviewed uh, on the pod two years ago now, wow. which we've been going for a while. Um, <coughs> yeah, we did an overview of his work, and he's he his work. He, I mean, he feels very present physically. Mm. He is, does have a cameo in My Little Loves and um, Petit Amoureux, but um, yeah. But yeah, that feels that pastoral, kind of slightly <coughs> terse, mundane pastoral French film mm. kind of makes itself known. Which is which is a tradition um, that you know I think even people like Bruno Dumont have, have eventually kind of yeah. picked up maybe yeah, yeah. With, with his Normandy films. I think um, that's still the the lingering after echoes of that world is still there. Cause, also, know. interestingly, uh, uh, you know who really loves Jean Eustache? Mm, Ira Sachs, director really? of Passages. M- both, I think, at least Petit Amoureuse, and I think mm. also uh, Mother on the Hall were in his 
top 10 for sight and sound and it's actually a very discursive nature to passages there's a lot of chat mm. about yeah, relationships yeah, 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 and, and negotiating um and it also has a, a menage a trois which is a very oh, yeah. uh, very uh modern horian um formulation yes easily one of the best films from 2023 for me top 10 passages yes mm. We should maybe do our top tens of the year. That would be an extra. I was debating it this afternoon, but I felt a little bit too sick to actually to commit pen to paper. But I think sometime oh, well, in the next maybe week or so. the next I'll do episode. It. We'll do before the end of the year, we'll do our end of year <laughs> lists. Of the, because we've actually seen a damn lot of films. There's loads of films this year. Because yeah. we did two festivals. Three, totally. Including Kino Tech. <laughs> 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 Sorry, <joke>. Ireland. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, we, so we've we've seen a lot of new films this yeah. year, and actually we we ate really well this year. Did we? We dined well, yeah, on film this year. I oh, think. on film, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah no, food actually. Ate really I well ate some year. good food. Well, I just didn't feel that was relevant to mention. No, no, I had some. You're going to some. St John's this weekend, and you're going the week after. I'm going, yeah, two weeks after. <laughs> two weeks after. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, to dine on the marrow, or not to dine on the marrow. But, um, uh, to slobber on the marrow of cinema. <laughs> that was sort of, you know, Peter Bradshaw. He does these like, mm. I'm Peter Bradshaw. This is Peter Bradshaw's vlog, and uh, I'd like to just say, while well, the slippery, slimy <laughs> cock of his criticism meets the the balls, the turgid, <laughs> saggy scrotum, the cold of, scrotum of discourse <laughs> is where I <laughs> and where you know he just like every he, every fucking video I see, he has a new like stupid twee like thing that he says they love the to describe it's like i've got the thesaurus out and i found another way to say cold yeah, it's like yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. turgid well look you know we're, we're not so different in that respect we we love being a bit verbose now and again but um yeah, yeah there's something slightly disgusting about that about um, peter bradshaw wow about peter bradshaw our friend peter bradshaw yeah friend um, fr- 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 friend uh, of the pods pod, peter bradshaw <laughs> we, we've hung out with this year we had a great time um yeah, does he know our podcast exists? Well, no, we did tell him, didn't we? But he was pissed. We did. We did, we did. Tell him. <laughs> yeah, we we definitely when when we briefed the run into him at the Berlin Film Festival. Oh, podcast, we got a book. He probably wasn't listening. Um, um, but um, you know, like unlike in many ways, a conversation <coughs> in a Eustache film. Yeah, we were talking across purposes. Yeah, and the most important, um, and also like a Eustache film, the most important thing about our conversation with Peter Bradshaw mm. was not the conversation itself, but the fact that we then told lots of told people, people about it yeah, about exactly. it yeah. because it's not like us and Peter had anything really in common or anything mm. worth saying it was all I mean he was just wrong just the same way he's wrong in print he was wrong in, in, in person commit to the, the bit of being wrong <laughs> just deeply but you wrong you were right that, that we've, we've hit the nail on the head with um, we had we stash, loved which telling is, people about it and we got a selfie with, or I you guys got a selfie you got, we got me and George got a selfie with it. it's like, but th- there is something about the other the, the telling and it, that's where it does kind of tessellate with Bart or Alain Bart in a way because Bart says that really love happens in the head of the desirer that's where the image of the beloved is constructed um, it's not a two-way street, you know. In in for but it's a, it's a very much like a, a one <coughs> one person echo chamber, um, in which we build up and kind of demolish the image of our beloved. And I think that's um, something which does speak <coughs> to you, Stash, in lots of ways because he is really interested in yeah, the sound and the idea of what his characters are incapable of actually obtaining in their lives, which might be quite easy for them to obtain if only they were a little bit more honest and a little bit more open and you know said the thing they needed to say in the right moment and that's what makes them very real because Cause we never do very relatable to then you know he's he's the filmmaker that's in the shower thinking oh my god if only i said that l'esprit de scalier yeah well but that's you fun. stash if you want to <laughs> uh, i would like to come back to my tweet about such amazing that you stash was not had no facial hair a very oh, really? a very hair sweet he had long lank hair, hair sweet he was, no, he wasn't hair sweet actually. He has her, very her, sweet. her sweet is the opposite when you have loads of hair. He's got he's got lot he had long lank hair but no beard, no moustache. Comrade in arms for you. Uh, as a non beard grower. As a non beard grower. Well I, you know, I, I I used to wear a moustache. Yes, no, I know, I know, no. But very well not, not, not a beard. Um, um Yes. Yeah. I don't know what So you, oh, you think he's like spiritually got he, facial hair he's spiritually got moustache spiritually or a beard, beard i think yeah spiritually bearded yeah. but um i think there's so i don't know what our next episode will, is going to be about um, i think our next episode will be the top 10 of the year that's my that's fun my vibe yeah that's fun Let's literally that. loads of uh, we might film that one actually 
Because it's jokes. Mm. Just us talking about films we've all seen. Be great. But I have n- a lingering, glimmering memory of maybe at best. Perfect. That's hey, I mean, you sh- you proved yourself more equipped than I to recall details. And anyway, yeah, we just need to sink a bottle of wine, and it will be very. It will come easily. That's we yeah. did actually one of I I re-listened to a little bit of it the other day. Our sort of when we done fifty episodes. Or oh, yeah, yeah, we did our favorite films. We so did far. Our, like well, no, twi- we'd only done twenty five episodes. But we did our, like our it's pr- we, premature. We wasn't ordered it? our all the films we talked about. This is before we started doing like director specials. But yeah, we ordered um, and yeah, you put Humanité by Dumont number I two. What was your number one? I oh. don't know. I still hold to that. Humanité is an extraordinary film. Yeah, I was mm. wrong about that actually. I, I mm. pulled Cold Water on it at the time, but I now understand mm. the Dumont project. The Dumont. It, I mean, I am excited for his oh, sci-fi new, project the next new, year. Um, yeah, it's a the new it. sort of continuation of the Concon Petit Concon exactly uh, universe. Which <laughs> Adil, Adele. Adil, is that popular? Is that Adele, no, no, no. Adele Heinel quit Heinel. the set of it because she thought it was too misogynistic and racist. Uh, yeah, and she also wanted to give up on film itself. So the, the whole industry of film was yeah, too. Uh, but I think sure, it was probably sure. mainly targeted at Bruno de Mont. Um, but Fair enough. Was, Bruno de Mont made a shit actor quit. Good. Good. I don't know if she's shit, actually. She just seems really annoying. Anyway, whatever. Causing more drama than we need to. We are, yeah. Let's just um, cap it. Let's uh, say au revoir. <laughs> and get out of this you station to you you station <laughs> alright the whatever. station you're waiting for <laughs> <laughs> it's not open <laughs> doors will not open at the, yeah. uh, bye